meeting, I'd like to call the meeting of the City of Oxnard Public Works and Transportation Committee to order. The city clerk will read a statement. Member Saragossa. Here. Member Lopez. Here. Chair Perello. Here. The agenda for this meeting was posted on the City Hall Bulletin Board on September 20th, 2022. If you wish to speak during public comments or a particular item on the agenda, please sign on by following the Zoom calling in steps listed above. Once the mayor calls for public speakers, please press nine to raise your hand to confirm, to inform the city clerk you would like to speak during the public speaking section for that particular item on the agenda while in the Zoom waiting room. In accordance with Assembly Bill 361 and in response to the declared state and local emergencies due to the novel coronavirus, the Oxnard City Council will meet in person and remotely. To participate remote, remotely, please visit www.oxnard.org. To find out how you may provide public comment, please refer to the instructions at, h, at www https slash slash forward slash www.oxnard.org slash city dash meeting slash. The public may view the meeting from home on Spectrum Channel 10, Frontier Channel 35, or YouTube at youtube.com slash Oxnard News. Video recordings of the meeting are typically available online following the meeting at the city's website. Please see the link for Measure M pre-recorded presentation video for each item listed on the agenda. You may participate in the meeting in the following ways. Attend the meeting at the location listed above. Submit a speaker card to the city clerk. Two, email comments or sign up to speak remotely before the meeting. Submit a request to speak by no later than 3 p.m. on the day of the meetings by using the form available at www.oxnard.org slash city meetings. B, submit an email to city clerk at oxnard.org no later than 3 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Indicate the agenda item number on the subject line. All email correspondence will be forwarded to the city council prior to the start of the meeting and made part of the legislative record, contact the city clerk's office at 805-385-7803 to submit your request. Pro number three, providing public comments remotely during the meeting. A, to provide public comment during the meeting, dial 888-475-4499 and enter the meeting ID and passcode listed above on the front page of the agenda. When the mayor announces the particular item on the agenda you want to speak on, press star nine to raise your hand while in the Zoom waiting room. Once called upon, press star six to unmute your phone. B, public comments on agenda items will be taken following the announcement of the item. After the item is announced, Members of the public may register or otherwise be recognized for the purpose of providing public comment. Please review the Zoom instructions on the registration page to help ensure there are no technical difficulties during your comments and help you understand public comment procedures using Zoom. Detailed participation instructions can be found at www.oxnard.org slash city meetings. Thank you, Chair Perello. Thank you very much, Madam City Clerk. Um, the posting of the agenda, was that, is that posting of the agenda is complete? Yes, sir. Yes, Chair Perello. thank you. Okay, I'd like to have uh, Council Member Vianney Lopez lead us in the pledge. And I'd like to take a moment of silence for a former city employee, a tremendous asset to the city of Oxnard, Mr. Efren Gorey. And I can speak only for myself. You have no idea the number of people that have reached out to say how much this gentleman impressed young lives. And I know that he impressed mine when I was younger, but in a different way. Thank you. Please stand. Ready, begin. I pledge to 
Thank you. Um, and I would just like to say this, um, this I believe will be the last time that we are able to sit up here with council member Vianney Lopez, Ms. Vianney Lopez. Uh, it's been a pleasure um, getting to know you. I've, I've learned more about you since information has come out in the newspaper of things and tremendous accomplishments and a tremendously big family. I'm like, holy cow, 11 brothers and sisters. Um, wish you the very best. And if you'd like to say something, Go ahead. Can I share something? And I um, also want to thank you, congratulate you, and, and thank uh, Governor Newsom for, for appointing you to the Board of Supervisors. I think it's a, a really important uh, position, and I believe that you can take care of it. I, I, we need to continue that liaison between the, uh, the county and the city, that partnership that we put together, and I believe that you're going to be that person who's going to be able to help us. We have a lot of projects that, that, that between the city and the, and, and, the, and the county, and I believe that, um, that we can do so with, with your help. And congratulations again you know, for, for the appointment to the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chair and Mayor. And uh, very briefly, do want to express my appreciation to everyone in the community who has come out in support. Um, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve the city of Oxnard in this capacity. And I want to thank the rest of the council um, for working with me, for, for being uh, count colleagues in, in meeting and serving our residents in Oxnard. And I especially want to thank the staff of the city. Mm -hmm. You all are so amazing in the work that you do. And I hate to get emotional, I'm mm. sorry. Um, but thank you all for your work. Um, you really make Oxnard a great place. And I feel so fortunate that I had the opportunity to work with so many of you and, um, and uh, to have uh, collaborated on, on, on several projects uh, to move the city forward and to serve our residents. And I, I, I hope that the public understands what tremendous assets our city has in so many ways from staff to resources to this wonderful city that we live in. And I am glad that I will continue to work with you all in a different capacity, but still to represent Oxnard and to work with the council. So thank you everyone. Thank you. The city manager wants to say. Very well said, uh, Bert. The city manager wants to say. Um, yes. yes, city manager. Uh, I'm not going to make a big speech. I just want to remind everyone that uh, we will have the soon to be supervisor back in these chambers um, in the near future to receive a formal resolution from the city council. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a real cry fest then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I would just like to say, she is her own person. She's gonna write her own story. She has nobody else's shoes to fill. She's gonna do a heck of a job filling V and Anil Lopez's shoes, representing the entire fifth district. I'm very fortunate to have her here. And I'm hopeful that somebody can fill her shoes when they come back on this council. Thank you. Moving on to the first item on the agenda. Are there any public comments on items not on the agenda, Madam Clerk? We do have one public speaker. One moment, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, uh, Chair Perolo and um, committee members and staff. I wasn't going to speak on this, but uh, Mr. Perolo kind of uh, opened the door. So um, I want to congratulate uh, Council Member Lopez. Um, I think it's absolutely fantastic that she'll have the opportunity, and this is this is where Bert and I might might uh, disagree a little bit, but I I hope that uh, she uh, follows 
um, Supervisor uh, Ramirez's agenda. Um, after all, I think that's what the uh, governor had in mind, and that's certainly what a lot of us in Oxnard had in mind. And I do want to do I do want to thank uh, Ms. Lopez for um, keeping on Carmen's staff. I think I think that I I think that she will be pleasantly surprised by their professionalism and uh, expertise. And they are they are I, I know them, and they are extremely they are extremely hardworking, diligent, and efficient. And they all have Oxnard's interest. Um, in their hearts. So, uh, VNA, congratulations again. Um, I am just, you know, I'm so, I'm so happy that we have uh, young leaders to um, step into the breach and uh, and do right by the city of Oxnard. So, I'll be commenting later, but I just wanted to uh, say this. Thank you and uh, good evening. Thank you. Are there any other speakers, Madam Clerk? We do not have any additional virtual speakers, and we also do not have speakers in person. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the first item on the consent agenda, C1, City Clerk's Department, approval of minutes. The recommendation that the Public Works and Transportation Committee approve the minutes for the September 13th regular meeting as presented. Are there any questions, concerns, or additions or subtractions wished? No, Chair, if there is no further changes, I move approval of the September 13th uh, meeting uh, minutes. No, second. Okay. Uh, roll call, please, Madam Clerk. Member Saragossa? Yes. Member Lopez? Yes. Chair Perello? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries three to zero. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The next item D1 reports. The Public Works Department, the subject, Agreement A-8493 with BPR Incorporated for on-call sidewalk, curb, and gutter, and spandrel grinding services project specifications number PW22-130. The recommendation that the Public Works and Transportation Committee recommend that the City Council approve and authorize Agreement A-8493 with P BPR incorporated for a total amount not to exceed $800,000 for a three-year term for the on-call sidewalk curb and gutter spandrel grinding services project specification PW, number PW22-130 project number M03102. Um, are there, and there, I understand there are no public speakers on this item, Madam Clerk? That is correct, Chair Perella. We do not have any public speakers. Do we have any questions from the committee? I um, I just want to share this is going to be an on-call agreement. Uh, it's my understanding. Uh, is who's uh, is that? Um, Michael, and um, we're looking at a total of eight hundred thousand dollars, not to for three-year term, and this is an uh, on-call basis. Is that the, if somebody calls in because of a sidewalk, or do we do any inspections, or how's it how's it going to work? Um, this has actually been started since um, 2017, so we've been doing sidewalk grinding since then. But we've been doing it neighborhood by neighborhood, according to where basically mostly the trees are growing within the city. So mm -hmm. systematically, we've been covering uh, the majority of the city. We almost are in the phase of, of circumventing the, the, the cycle. So my understanding too, there's some, some of the sidewalks that are unleveled. If we don't have the funding to take care of the media that you'll have, what is it called a ramp, ramp type of a, a temporary condition or, or replacement or work, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, typically uh, we have a displacement within the sidewalk. Um, if it goes above two inches or more, typically we will start ramping it with AC until we can come back and do a R and R, which is remove and replace. And, and, and Mr. Chair, you know we have 650 miles of sidewalks, and, and also uh, 640 miles of curb and gutters. I mean that's a tremendous amount of miles. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Philip Schweider. I'm the streets manager. I'm sorry. What is it again? Philip Schweider. I'm the streets manager. Okay, thank you. So 650 miles of sidewalks. Yes, sir. And, and also 644 miles of curb and gutters. 
Yes, sir. So, so that that's a tremendous amount of work that or miles that we have that potentially will require work. Yeah. Okay, but this is on an on-call basis. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Chair, I do have, and thank you. That, that was one of my questions in terms of um, the uh, how how they're evaluated um, or the sidewalks are evaluated. If it if it's an on call, is it based on someone calling in and you know submitting a concern or complaint of a sidewalk, or is there an ongoing surveying of the sidewalks? Uh, yes, basically, what the streets division does is within the on call, we are responding to the three one one request as well as our own internal inspections. Once we go out to any one location, we are looking to the left, we are looking to the right, and um, making that assessment. But typically what we're doing right now is we're gathering all the information per neighborhood and we're assigning the, the contractor to, to do the majority of the neighborhoods by neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Mr. Schweiber, thank you very much. And I, I've had an opportunity to work with you before you do a tremendous job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just quickly, I believe the distance from here to San Francisco is a little hmm. around 500 miles. So literally my understanding is we have sidewalk beyond from here to San Francisco that we have to take care of. I know the city manager will whip it up here in a second, how far <laughs> it is, but I should have checked this before. <laughs> there are, and the reason I bring this up, there are a tremendous amount of people that look at social media and there are some individuals, very few that complain about the city of Oxnard's work in certain areas. And some people comment that we're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. I don't see very many members of the public here, but I know hopefully some people are watching and this will come to the city council. But the photographic evidence that's presented in this presentation shows a tremendous amount of work. Mm. And for those people that you know, complain, I often wonder if they know how they can get on social media and they can be like an assassin in the dark. Do they ever take a look at the PowerPoints that come out? Because of Measure M, we can't have a presentation here. We can't show it on the screen. And they belittle the people that work for the city and public works who are held accountable by the director of public works standing next to you and the city manager sitting down and the seven members on the council. And um, I'm just reaching out to those people. Wake up. The city's doing a heck of a lot to make things better for you. Uh, I don't have any questions um, that haven't been addressed. I want to thank you very much. And city manager, public works director, Wolf wants to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to point something out. Um, I thought it was interesting in the staff report that total number of locations in the last couple of years that are actually done under this contract are almost 35,000 locations mm. done. I mean, that's quite a bit of work uh, over a two-year period. So I thought that was an interesting stat that needed to be expressed. Thank you. It, um, you could say it's an oversight on my that I didn't jump on that, but it is. Ladies and gentlemen that have a job, how many 35,000 locations do you take care of with your own personal job? And when you wanna take care of and complain about the city of Oxnard, just remember that. There's a lot of good people that work for this city. This happens to be the public works and transportation, but top to bottom, and the bad apples get weeded out. But top to bottom, this is a hell of an organization. I'm proud to be a council member serving this organization. Thank you, Mr. Schwerber. Mr. Chair, can I ask one more quick question? Uh, the uh, I, one of the things that I get a lot of complaints about or 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 information about required is the roots on, on the trees, the trees that cause a lot of are, are they primary? Are they on top of the other uh, type of work that we need to do, or which is the most important? Or they all are uh, sure. Yes, sir. Uh, everything is important. Um, typically, the root system is the culprit to many of the displacements within the. Uh, the city sidewalks, uh, as well as homeowner trees that are right. causing displacements. Um, and when we can, if we could do a remove and replace, we will. And that's that's our main goal is to make it to what the, okay. the, to the state of the purpose that is intended to be. However, we are a tree city and the, the, ultimately the roots are- and, and the reason I'm asking that is because in the county, they um, they had a 50-50 cost. That if somebody wanted to get rid of the or correct the root problem before the the city got there, so I'm not sure if we have such a program here in the city. You know that I think it's 
if if the resident wants to help repair that sidewalk, you know, do we have the ability to do that too? Good evening, Chair and Committee members. Brian Young is Assistant Public Works Director. Uh, no, we do not have that 50-50 share, but I know that uh, Mr. Hallett, the other Assistant Public Works Director, is working on a tree policy that uh -huh. addresses some of those issues with the with the roots and uh, um, and property owners. But most of these trees that are making these sidewalk lifts are belong to us. They're in the public right away. So, and, and Brian, let me let me. Uh qualify that as trees that were coming from the backyard of somebody's house. And that was a 50 50. Oh, from the, okay. Yeah. yeah, most of these trees that we're having issues with are from, are, from the, the city side. Yeah, or from the okay. city side, definitely. But something and, to look at anyway, so. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I did want to mention one more thing um, about, uh, those were some good stats that were mentioned earlier, but we, we also, someone also mentioned some of our temporary repairs that we do with asphalt. And yeah. those temporary repairs obviously are then logged and we try to get back to them when mm -hmm. funding and staff's available. Uh, right now we have nine vacancies in streets. So those people mm -hmm. out there listening, uh, look on our website, there's a job for you. Um, <laughs> also, uh, we have a million dollars in ARPA funds that we are also be addressing some of those uh, sidewalks. So th that'll Great. be coming soon. Working with the engineering team to identify some of those areas and get some of those larger lifts repaired with the full replace and uh, uh, replacement of concrete and of all those panels. So. Mr. Chair, I remember last year, I think, or two years ago, they went in front of my house or around the block anyway, and they were grinding some of the uh, the lifts that were maybe about, I, I don't know, maybe half Two inches and under, we'll grind them. Anything right. above that, we have to- uh, Right, that's what it was, yeah. Lift, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yanis, thank you very much for mentioning the job availability. Maybe we should have a sign in back of me saying jobs available <laughs> because there are a lot of parents that right. look at this thing and their kids may be looking for work and it's a good job working for the city of Oxnard. Excuse me, Chair Perello. We do have one hand up for public comment. Would you like to take that caller? Yes. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Mr. Yanis. Caller with number ending in 8387, please unmute by pressing star six. Speaker with phone number ending in 8387, please unmute by pressing star six. Hello, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello? Yes, hello. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Uh, sure, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. What is your name, sir? Oh, great. Uh, my name is Douglas Portello. Thank you. Go ahead, you have three minutes to speak. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair Perillo and committee members, staff and the public. Um, I'd like to just point out uh, in my neighborhood in Cabrillo, a number of folks have uh, come to me as the chair of the Career Neighborhood Council, and this is one of the areas that they often talk about: are the parkways of the tree and the trees, you know, lifting up the sidewalk. And I'm glad that they've been grinding them because it's a public safety hazard. In front of my house, it was more than two inches, and we had two persons trip and almost fall. They were elderly. And they did come out and they actually replaced the slab there because they couldn't grind it. It was too high. And it's just really a situation where we have these carrot wood trees and it's just basically, you know, wrong tree, wrong place. We just had a consultant come in and evaluate our tree maintenance program. And they talked about this and it's just a difficult issue because my neighborhood was in the mid eighties. So this goes way back, right? And I'm glad some of these things are getting addressed. I had a one resident that was actually the curb itself. It wasn't the sidewalk as much. It was the actual curb. And it was lifting up the curb to where if they were washing their car or they were, you know, turning on their sprinklers, the water is pooling there. So I did call that in um, to the public works. And they said they'd get on it. And actually, this gentleman, uh, he had a public works truck come by 
and he stopped. He flagged him down. He stopped. And he was told that that would get taken care of in May. So that was at the beginning part of the year. And then I had my conversation with him in August. So I, you know, shared that address. I just also feel like probably a really good avenue for folks to get in communication with the city about problems they're having with their sidewalks. I always recommend people um, use the Auction Art 311 app. Uh, that puts a timestamp on whatever issue they have, and then they get back to you, right? So they'll say, well, it's in process, or they'll say the job's completed. Sometimes they say the job's completed and it's not, but at least you have an opportunity to you know, communicate back to them and have that dialogue. So it's good. I, I know sometimes they, folks call the city, they don't know exactly where to call or who to get in touch with, but I really encourage everyone to use the Auction Art 311 app. And, you know, again, it's just a big problem that's gone on for a long time. And in terms of replacing those trees, because that um, company said, you know, they shouldn't really be doing the um, pruning of the roots because it could introduce disease, it can destabilize the tree. And it's my understanding that they're continuing to do that root pruning, which is not ideal, but I guess they just figure that's what we need to do right now in the immediate situation. Our so I just want to upset. share that with you and thank you. Thank you very much for sharing. And I appreciate the fact that you do uh, tell people to use 311. Uh, it's a very successful program the city of Oxnard have as, and I would like to, request you to get the information where you claim that the city of Oxnard said the work was done, but it wasn't. Facts matter, evidence matters. I hope that you can bring that to our public works director, Mr. Wolf. I'm interested in that. Um, are there any other public speakers, Madam Clerk? We do not have any additional speakers virtually and we do not have any public speakers in person. Thank you, Chair Perello. Are there any other comments by the committee member? No. If that all move the recommended action. Second. Roll call, please. Chair Perello? Yes. Member Saragossa? Yes. Member Lopez? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries three to zero. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next item on the agenda, D2, Public Works and Transportation Committee agenda report. The subject, consideration of naming a sports field at Durley Park, the Helen Lopez Field. The recommendation that the Public Works and Transportation Committee recommend that the City Council, number one, review and consider the request from the Sunset Little League, along with the recommendations from Parks, Recreation and Community Services Commission to name a sports field at Durley Park, the Helen Lopez Field. And number two, direct staff to install appropriate signage to effectuate the naming should it be approved, taking into consideration upcoming park improvements. Do we have any public comments on this, Madam Clerk? We do not have any public comments at this time. Thank you, Chair. Do the committee members have any questions or concerns? Y yes, sir. I um, really wanna thank the Parks uh, Commission and, and also the Community Relations uh, Services Commission. And I, had the pleasure of working with Helen Lopez for years, years and years and years. In fact, uh, one of the things that he, my son, Johnny, played uh, in Sunset Little League for 13 years, starting as a T-ball. He was so tiny at the time that the bat was bigger than he was. And and I remember that uh, when he was playing ball, you know, some, it was just a lot of fun because uh, the kids over there hitting the ball and the T-ball, instead of running to first base, they'd run to third base. And, and, and Helen was always there supporting the kids, always uh, making sure that the snack bar was going, making sure that the fields were okay. And it was part of the, of the board. And also I, um, I believe that uh, she's now an elderly person, you know, she's, um, you know, she's really a person that really has helped uh, the community tremendously. And naming that, uh, that field, the senior, I, I'm gonna shift to the senior field, but it's it's the um, it's the field that uh, that'd be a very really appropriate that we name it after her, and and again, um, I did meet with the uh, little league board and they and they all support her. In fact, right now, the board goes over to Helen just to find out how do we do X and what do we do Y, 
what happened 20 years ago, what happened 30 years ago, and she was right there to, to help them out. In fact, when the, uh, the I think it was last year, we had a fire there at the snack bar, and, and instead of, uh, Public Works was really, really great about helping us out, the fire department, and, and, and the board got panicked, and there was Helen. I said, wait a minute, slow down, one thing at a time, you know, and the restrooms are closed, and then we added uh, uh, portable restrooms, and anyway, she is, just one fascinating lady that's really had helped hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids there at Sunset Little League. And, and in fact, one of the things I was just sharing with uh, my staff today, when uh, I got involved with, when my son was playing, they needed a scorekeeper. And at that time I was preparing income taxes, didn't have right in the tax season. And also um, had my own business and so forth. And uh, they called me to, uh, to, uh, Score keep. Well, what a mistake. I'm there after I started 13 years later. I'm, I'm there at Sunset Little League being part of the board. My wife was a team mother. She was ran the snack bar and Helen was there. Helen was there helping us out. So anyway, I really, really, uh, Mr. Chair, support the naming of, of this uh, of this uh, field too with Helen Lopez Park. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, if I if I can ask, and Mayor, I appreciate that uh, th the personal insight on on Ms. Lopez. I I think um, you know unless we've worked with someone, it you know someone may not understand or generally won't understand why uh, why uh, the recommendation is coming forward. Uh, and I think it's certainly a question that has come up in the past: is how how is the city deciding uh, the naming of any public space, um, whether it's a building, a park, or a field? Um, so I, if I can ask, um, thank you, Mr. Howlett, <laughs> to uh, go over the uh, resolution and the steps that are considered in the process of, of naming and how we how this comes to the council. For and and, and uh, can I share something to add a little bit to I know that uh, you're going to share how what the, the um, protocol is of, of naming buildings and so forth but we do uh, want to remind us that the bedford pinkard park uh, skateboard park was named when uh, when mr pinkard was alive just for information go ahead thank you committee chair and chair members steve hallett assistant director of public works uh this is possible through resolution number 12 uh 12991 this was approved in April of 1977, and it basically has nine steps. Uh, steps one through three are basically any uh, person or organization can submit a request for naming of a city property, whether it be a field, a building, or mm -hmm. uh, any other such owned property, and that uh, such a request shall be filed with the city clerk. and. Uh, the request uh, for the recreation facility will be reviewed by the Parks and Recreation Commission, which all three of those have been done up to this point. Uh, then there are other items that uh, item number four uh, is for a facility other than Parks and Recreation can be considered. Item number five is if, uh, if there is another proposed name, so a group comes up and says, we want to name it one thing, and another group says, we want to name it another. There is that possibility that there can be another proposed name. And then uh, step number six, after thoroughly evaluating the name submitted and any recommendations, the committee and the council at its discretion will select the name of the facility. Uh, number seven says, although exceptional, city council does have the ability to name uh, a facility after a living person. Step number eight says that if the person is deceased, five years must pass before that person can be considered. Mm -hmm. And then step number nine was an administrative step that uh, uh, repeals section F6. So those are the steps that uh, need to be taken. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I would just like to share some things here. I believe, uh, Mayor, you were on the council when this was approved. You're listed as as one of the, the I votes, and you were on the council when this was approved. Right. 
and um, in 2005. Um, I had way before I got on this council, I attended a school board meetings at the Rio School District, and there was a very hot item on the agenda. Um, it having to regard with with regard to naming a particular piece of building property after a school board member that served for 40 years. And there were comments made at that board that really were trying, but they were public and it was made. We should never name anything until a person dies. And they named it after the individual and to his credit to the to the board that they overruled that view. And I subscribe to that. But I would also like to bring focus to the thing. I'm sure there are a lot of things that have been named after Mr. Brett Favre, although you're innocent till proven guilty, that I feel there are people that are going, whoa, wish we hadn't done that. I support this, but I support this on one grounds. The Sunset Little League is the first party that brought this to this or brought this up. Then the Parks and Rec Commission brought it up. I had an opportunity to speak with the Parks and Rec Commission member. And um, as I recall, there were not very many parks and rec that were even aware of this young lady. And that's one of the tragedies when we don't have, shall we call it a deep bench in the city of Oxnard, people involved in a lot of things and they stay involved and they know something. We have a mayor that served a lot of time with the city of Oxnard. And, uh, and now I'm here for a while and council member Lopez is here and, and you know, things happen, but I think it's great that there's an opportunity to recognize somebody before they're dead for all the good deeds and all the good wills that they have done. But I do want to caution, there are gonna be requests. I can give one that I'm, I feel is an interesting one to view, the Oxnard Beach Park. There's a request to name that something else in honor of the Kumash Indians. There's a request to name various other buildings after other stuff. There's, I just mentioned a moment of silence for a gentleman that died, Mr. Efren Gore. I'm sure there's gonna be requests there. These things are serious matters and I do appreciate that it does go before the city council. I give credit to the people that approved this resolution back in 2005. So we can go to the city council, much like a wedding. Somebody always says, if you have anything to say, say it now or forever shut up. They may not use the word shut up, but remain silent. There are certain things that need to be aired and certain things that need to pass. And I support this, but I wanted to share that. And one question that I have of staff, there's one thing that I don't like in the report, and it's not the staff's fault. Under financial impact, there is no financial impact for the naming of the field. However, there may be future costs associated with the signs or plaques acknowledging the field name. These costs may be paid through donations. The staff report starts out and explains exactly the why and everything else. But it says on the last paragraph of the genuine staff report, it says recently the city was awarded a seven million seven start over. Recently the city was awarded a seven million dollar grant to renovate Durley Park. The renovations projects include turning the, the ball fields to centralize all the backstops to the concessions and restroom buildings, therefore due to the pending construction, any new amenities, including permanent plaques or signs are not recommended at this time. However, if the naming is approved, a temporary sign can be placed until each, such time as the park renovations would incorporate a permanent sign. My question is this, underneath the statement financial impact, and I don't fault this because I can understand how this could come up. It says these costs may be paid through donations. If we're gonna get $7 million, how can we not put some money aside for the plaques that are gonna be required? And if not, how can we not buy them, have them made and put them in storage where they don't disappear? There's gotta be a secure place in the city of Oxnard that we don't have to hustle nickels and dimes from people to put a plaque to honor the decision that this council, if they approve the council would make. Okay. So I, I can take that uh, council Thank member. You. So first of all, this, the staff report simply points out that's an option. It's not committing to it either way, right? The, the key here is that we do have this grant to improve Durley Park and we wanna do the construction work First. before we figure out what to do about this signage. Um, but typically how this works is uh, in, in most communities, there, there are different ways to, to have um, 
for lack of a better term, to have your name put on a facility or a building. There's the wealth way, right? Where you make huge contributions and your name goes on the side of a building. And then in this case, similar uh, to this one, there's just ordinary community people who, who the community um, uh, want to have things named after them. And in, in those cases, it does make sense for the, the municipality to pay for uh, whatever it is that we should decide uh, somehow later. I'm not sure how we're gonna decide whether it's gonna be a plaque, a tree, a flag, whatever. So um, we're not making that decision yet, right? So this is, but this is to just inform you that that's possible if people wanna do that. Mr. Chair. Um, for staff, you know, I met with the, the league um, and you probably had it, Steve. They mentioned to me, if the city needs help, the board would fund, you know, the, the board. And additionally, what they said too, they need another light in front of the snack bar. This is if the city can do it, fine. If not, they'll pay for it too, because they're willing to do that because of Helen, because they want that park to be nice, a nice looking park with a nice board that says Helen Lopez Field. And also they're willing to provide a light there for, and they'll pay for it. That's what they, they, they mentioned to me, just for information. But, but I think it, it ultimately depends on what the yes. expectation is. So it's one thing to have a plaque. It's another thing to have, say, a statue. No, there's no right? statue. So it just depends on what it is that people are hoping for. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, Excuse me, Chair Perello. Yes. We have a virtual caller with the hand up. Okay. Okay. Would you like to take that call now? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Hi, yes, can you thank hear me? you. Which, yes, may I? Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. Uh, it's Douglas Bartello. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, good evening again, uh, Chair and Committee members. Uh, I'm glad that I attended this meeting tonight because I got a little information about how that process works, like for naming a park or other buildings, because I had attended a Parks Commission meeting in which an agenda item was put forward to possibly name a park after Marvin Boos, which seemed like a great idea, right? I mean, Marvin's done a lot. He's out there all the time. He's been out there for years. I've worked personally with Marvin out in parks and here in Doris and other areas. But it uh, did raise a question in my mind, like how that process works. And so I was also curious to know about what uh, public information would be shared that there's a consideration for maybe renaming a park or naming uh, a park. And then obviously someone will submit, you know, recommendation, but just the public awareness. Cause like right now tonight, I've only seen five people, you know, watching. So I just wonder in that process, is there some uh, information that goes out to the public? So, you know, perhaps someone has some other person that, they feel like would deserve some consideration uh, for a park or something else being named. And I'm just wondering like for public engagement and responses for the public when these types of things are being considered, you know, how much of the public is aware? Because sometimes these things are follow the proper process and there's a very worthy person that gets their name named after a park, but then the public may come back and say, well, hey, I didn't know about that. So, you know, public engagement is very important. I try to do it actively myself all the time, but just making more awareness out there, making more of an effort to communicate with the public that, you know, this is under consideration. So you can certainly, you know, exercise your right to publicly engage and maybe, you know, have uh, a, a submission yourself and just understand how that process works and then perhaps then you can, you know, get into that process if you feel that's something that would be important uh, that you'd like to bring forward. So thank you very much. Uh, thank Mrs. you. Chair, thank you. a quick response. Uh, we do public engagement all the time, and that's kind of how this uh, issue is before you tonight. Mr. Mr. Chair, we're, we're not naming a park. This is only a feel, you know, this is 
of, of it within the park. It's not even Durley Park is there. There's four or five fields. This is the only a field, not even the park, you know, which is really, and this young lady, believe it or not, I think she's close to 90 years old, you know, so I'm just for information, you know, so, and she's been there for four decades. But, but uh, you know, good comment, but again, you know, this is only a few, we're not even naming the park. I just want to share that. I, I want to express, I'm grateful that the, the caller attended tonight and he learned something. Um, and I'm, I say that with no sarcasm, but this is one of the issues because of Measure M, right. we do not have a presentation. And any caller, the one, in, the recent one or any of the other callers, if they would have read the staff report or looked at the video that was presented and available to the public, which I see no members of the public, even in the audience in person, they would have seen the information. And the caller brings up an excellent, some excellent points. So I'd like to get staff to come back up to the podium, please, and identify the parts that are in the photographs, which we do not show because of Measure M, and who they're named after and why they're named after those individuals. Sure, Chair Perello. Um... I'll try to go off memory here. Uh, we, we can start with Community Center Park West. There are two fields out there that are named after fallen police officers. Mm -hmm. There's also a former, field. Former Oxnard police officer. Oh, Brian. And then there is also, oh, thank you. Ruta Beck. Uh, there is also a field at Beck Park that's also named after a fallen police officer, the O'Brien Field. Mm -hmm. uh, to acknowledge the other two names at Community Center Park West, that is Officer Clark and Officer Adair. Mm -hmm. And then for uh, Durley Park, where the proposed Helen Lopez Field is, there is one other field that is currently named, and that's the Bull Field. Uh, Mr. Bull was, was the Mr. founder Bull. of the Sunset Little League. So Thank you very much. And, yes. and I would just also like to say the Sunset Little League um, this past year had a presentation of the people that made it to the finals, right. not the final finals, the actual final game of a world championship representing Oxnard coming out of this park. And I believe it was a car club that made a plaque and there's a a metal plaque on the screens. Right. Uh, and we have a terrific plaque presentation of the jacket, photos of the kids when they were the young mm -hmm. at the library for people to see. But again, to the credit of the city staff, the sometimes much maligned city staff, all of this is in the staff report if someone will take the time to read it. Thank you, Mr. Hallett. Mr. Chair, I want to point out one other um, item here, which is and, and there's a minor discrepancy with the steps. Uh, when this resolution was, was originally drafted and updated, um, the, the folks at the time didn't contemplate that we would have council committees. So um, part of what's in step five states that at the uh, council or the commission meeting, uh, any person, entity or organization uh, could show up, uh, attend and propose a, another name. Um, and I just want to say for the record, there's nobody here to do that. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for adding that, City Manager. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I'd like to make a motion that we approve item one and two in this. Chair, okay. I'll second that and if they open up for any further discussion. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, no. Um, roll call, Madam Clerk, please. Member Saragossa? Yes. Chair Perello? Yes. Member Lopez? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries 320. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Thank you, staff, for the help here. Excellent work. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda, number three, Public Works Department. Subject, amend department dash wide blanket purchase orders for not to exceed amount greater than $200,000 each. The recommendation that the Public Works and Transportation Committee recommend that the City Council approve and authorize the purchasing agent to amend the following. And there are five specific items under this recommendation. Number one, purchase order number 8797 with Consolidated Electrical Distributors 
for an additional $100,000 for a new not to exceed amount of $300,000 through June 30th, 2023. Number two, purchase order number 8831 with Napa doing business as Ventura County Auto Supply for an additional $200,000 for a new not to exceed amount of $400,000 through June 30, 2023. Number three, purchase order number 8841 with Ferguson Enterprises LLC for an additional $150,000 for a new not to exceed amount of $350,000 through June 30th, 2023. Number four, purchase order number 8842 with Famco Pipe and Supply Incorporated for an additional $400,000 for a new not to exceed amount of $600,000 through June 30th, 2023. And number five, purchase order number 8859 with O'Reilly Auto Parts for an additional $100,000 for a new not to exceed amount of $300,000 through June 30th, 2023. There was again, and as previous speakers have brought up, there is a presentation available, but because of Measure M and the shenanigans with that item, we're not able to see it. Um, do we have any speakers on this item, Madam Clerk? We do not have any public speakers virtually, and we also do not have any public speakers here in person. Thank you, Chair Perello. Thank you. Um, do the committee members have any questions on this? Yeah, I just want to thank uh, staff for bringing this over, uh, and uh, maybe staff can uh, briefly uh, give us the opportunity, sir and the BPO, the Blanket Purchase Agreement, because uh, one of the things that it says here is, is for repetitive needs, goods needs, it's for efficiency, for reoccurring needs, for, for advantages, for discounts, and, and et cetera, et cetera, which is, can you share a little bit more on this? I'm, I'm naming about three, four items that, that can help us with the, with the BPO as compared to a purchase order. Sure, good evening, Mayor and Chair Perello. Committee member Lopez, congratulations. Um, yes, we we go through, we have needs um, for routine services. And we look for those uh, starting with the first one with consolidated electrical distribution uh, distributors. Uh, we have uh, VFDs, variable frequency drives that we use for our pumps and motors. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to keep those as consistent and use Rockwell automation. So for that, particular vendor, we look at, at consolidating all of our equipment into one and use a sole source for them. They're the only people in Southern California that can sell the Rockwell automation uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. So with the other ones, we have source well. So these are group uh, purchase orders that blanket purchase orders that we're able to get bulk pricing on and, and discounts on the equipment that we need to get for uh, repairs, normal services for like with Napa and with O'Reilly for auto parts for our older vehicles. Um, Ferguson uh, Enterprises, we get all of our piping from there for water distribution mains and hydrants and, and various other equipment for working on our distribution system. And uh, FAMCON's the same way. And I think you said something important too about uh, the sole source agreements or some companies that only utilize or actually make what we need and nobody else makes it or near maybe uh, in the Western US or something like that. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, that yeah. is correct. Uh, especially with CED or, excuse me, uh, consolidated electrical distributors. Thank you. Basically, some of these companies basically have a monopoly because the people that manufacture it will not sell to anybody else. And they lock up a regional area, sometimes as large as Southern California for if you want to buy it, you got to come to me. And usually somebody that makes something like that, they make a really top quality thing and there's no competition. It's not like we can go to Amazon. Am I kind of correct on that? That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate this. I know that we have to have these parts and we need, we have to, they're not things that um, if the variable drives go down, 
That's not something that we can wait around. It's something that's got to be fixed because they are important to the manuf to the operation of the public works department, usually water and sewer. And if is that correct? That is correct. And, and we have requirements, regulatory requirements, if any of these e piece of equipment could go down to to make sure that we have a reliable source of water and to make sure that we don't have any any spills associated with the or releases at the wastewater treatment plant. Which gets into a lot of penalty big bucks and unhealthy situation. Correct. Thank you. Um, and does the public works director wish to? Yeah, good evening. Um, Michael Wolf, director of public works. I wanted to, to mention also um, some of the reasons why we go with these, some of these manufacturers is to ensure the warranty is continued as well. So it's, it's a little less about the, the monopoly that that term um, it's more about making sure that uh, we keep the warranty in place if originally manufactured equipment, those kinds of things. So that's also a consideration when we want to purchase parts. It's not just that they're the only supplier. We want to also make sure we keep the warranty in place um, for those kinds of things. So, excellent point. Thank you for bringing that up. Any further questions? And, and also, I believe, you know, it's, it's really important because this is a health and safety issue. Things uh, like water and wastewater and or even refuse cannot go down for one or two days. You know, we need to have it done now, you know, which I think is extremely important. Right. To your question earlier, Mayor, the the, the advantages are, are many, uh, one of which is bulk pricing. But again, it's also expediency in getting a response, as, as Mr. Marcinko mentioned. Uh, there's lots of state mandates and requirements That's for, right. for um, sanitary and, and water. And so waiting around to do a purchasing process uh, cost us time and money just from that standpoint, but also potentially a, a safety issue from a health standpoint. Or a major spill too. <laughs> we do avoid that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Just Chair. one last question. Do we keep spares on hand or we are assuming that we can call them and because we got a blanket purchase order, we're going to get it? For, for certain equipment, we do. We keep the spares as long as it's cost, um, you know, effective <laughs> to do something like that. Certain things that are, are specialized, like the VFDs, are set for certain pumps and motors, and they're very expensive. So on some of those items, it doesn't, it's cost prohibitive to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. And the same for fleet. So uh, maybe a little higher turnover items we'll keep on stock, but some of the very unique things we don't, we don't keep on stock unless we, need, uh, we order kind of on demand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Jose Areola, Fleet Services Manager. Um, with some of these agreements, we're actually able to have the vendor stock the parts for us mm -hmm. and not have, uh, for example, Fleet Services take on the cost of having all that stock uh, in in our facilities. They can stock whatever amount we we ask them to. So, thank you for coming. Helpful. Thank you for coming up and bringing that up. And, and I forget your last name. Areola. Areola. And thank you very much for bringing it up because I do remember that when the city manager came in, that was one of the things that we did. We had areas where there was a lot of parts and we, uh, Mr. Nguyen, we did away with that to have better control of the parts. And it has been a big benefit to the city of Oxnard. Thank you for coming up and, and right, adding thanks. that. Mm -hmm. So do you need a motion? A motion to approve? Huh? Yeah. I'll second. Okay. Madam Clerk, can we take the roll please? Chair, may I please confirm who made the motion? Zaragoza one and Lopez two. Thank you. Chair Perello? Yes. Member Lopez? Yes. Member Zaragoza? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries three to zero. I'd like to thank the entire staff that came up and helped in that presentation. Thank you very much. The next item. Um, <clears throat> The next item is item number four. The title of the item is climate action, and climate action and Adaptation Plan for an Addendum to the 2030 General Plan Program Environmental Impact Report, PEI, semicolon, SCH, pound sign 2007041024. The recommendation that the Public Works and Transportation Committee, four points. Receive, number one, receive a presentation by the city draft climate action and adaption plan. Number two, receive public comment on the draft CAP 
CAAP document. Number three, provide recommendations on planning commission and staff's recommendation recommended edits. And number four, provide feedback on the draft CAAP document. There will be a live presentation on this by Mr. Jeff Catron and Shannon uh, Wages, Environmental Science Associates. Uh, and first off, can we explain to the public that may be watching, why will this be live and the others were not live? Yes, Chair Prello, uh, Council Member Zaragoza, <clears throat> Council Member Lopez. Uh, this is a presentation by the city's consultant and given that the consultant will be doing it uh, and you can get that ready, uh, Jeff, this is why it's not subject to measure M. I'll just provide a few comments and then close out the presentation. So with that, if you wanna go ahead and share screen, great. Excuse me, Chair Perello. I did wanna go ahead and let you know we do have one public comment speaker virtually. Okay. Would uh, you like to take that after the presentation? I think, I think it would be better if we have them after because they get an opportunity to hear this and they may wanna modify their questions. Thank you, Chair Perello. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Council um, Chair. Chair Prello and Mayor, Council Member. Uh, this evening, we're presenting um, the Climate Action Adaptation Plan, and I want to just quickly uh, indicate who's on the call, who will be giving the presentation this evening. I have Jeff Caden, with, uh, who's a principal with Environmental Sciences Associates, uh, Shannon Wages, who is a principal planner with ESA, and also Brian Schuster, who is also uh, with ESA. Um, I also wanted to thank the Public Works Department. As you can see, they're here in force, uh, and they have been great partners in preparing the, the cap um, for the city and the residents. I also have the um, building official, Jeff Pengeli, who's here, can, who can also help uh, answer any questions you may have. Um, tonight is really the, the culmination of, or uh, with one more step at council, of a two and a half year work effort uh, to put together what is the best solution for addressing greenhouse gas emissions, as well as climate resilience and adaptation for the city. This document represents uh, input made by a variety of uh, bodies, committees, as well as stakeholder groups and the community through a series of engagement efforts in both English and Spanish, as well as community surveys in English and Spanish, we, we received very robust input. Um, we also had to flex due to COVID, and um, that was also a bit of a challenge, but um, we're, we're proud of the document before you and, uh, and what it's presenting for our community. Um, the meetings really did help identify climate change impacts of most concerns and the best ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our community and to improve community, community resilience and adaptation. Uh, with that, I'm going to just go over the purpose, um, receive a presentation on our cap before you here, um, receive public comments on the cap, provide recommendations on three specific planning commission recommendations for augmenting the language in the cap. And we'll, we have some slides going through that. And then also then for the committee to provide feedback on the cap before you. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Jeff Caden. All right, thanks, Kathleen. So the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, which we use CAAP as a shorthand, it helps implement two goals from the sustainable communities element of the city's 2030 general plan, one of those being to develop the plan itself. And it also supports implementation of general plan sustainability goals. Uh, the CAP has two primary objectives. One is to implement the council approved target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. And that's consistent with Senate Bill 32. The second objective is to enhance the community's resilience to a, cli a changing climate by addressing climate vulnerabilities and risks. And then the CAP includes strategies and actions to achieve that council approved greenhouse gas reduction target. Here is an outline of the Climate Action Plan showing the five chapters and the uh, six appendices. Just wanna kind of jump to the main components. Uh, one is identifying where greenhouse gases are coming from. And that's uh, in relation to the community at large and to the municipal operations. You can see that on the left, there's a pie chart that uh, this depicts the community greenhouse gas inventory. And show, it's, this shows that the majority of emissions or the biggest com, uh, contributor to emissions is transportation. 
followed by electricity and natural gas used in buildings, and then followed by solid waste. And, and together, these uh, different sectors, we call them, contribute 95%, about 95% of total emissions. And on the right side is a pie chart depicting the municipal greenhouse gases. This means that the greenhouse gases coming from municipal operations, broken down by where they're the different sources. And overall, the emissions from municipal operations represent about 3% of total community emissions. Excuse me, the pardon, me. Include, pardon me, pardon me. Yeah. Um, if, the, my, if my committee members have a question during this presentation, we'll ask the question so that we don't get too far behind. And yeah. if we're gonna be using these slides, and I appreciate you are, do you have a PowerPoint or something that you can identify where you're talking? on these slides, it would be beneficial to the members of the public that are watching this on television. Thank you, those are my comments, go ahead. I'm sorry, the last- I think he's referring to, if you could use your cursor, if there's anything specific you wanna point out on each slide. Okay. Yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. The, the, the cap includes 14 greenhouse gas reduction strategies that are organized under seven major categories. And those categories are clean energy, green buildings, transportation, land use, water conservation and reuse, waste reduction and recycling, and nature-based solutions. The, um, there are several key strategies that build on the city's existing programs and documents and work efforts. And that includes items like the city joining the Clean Power Alliance in 2018. That's an important strategy. Uh, implementing the 2013 Energy Action Plan implementing the sustainable transportation plan that the current the city is currently developing, and then various waste reduction and water conservation initiatives. Uh, implementation of other greenhouse gas strategies will, will require investment of staff and resources. And all strategies have specific implementing actions, many of which are critical to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and we'll touch on those in a moment. Overall, there's 85 implementing actions. The cap also I have, addresses a, I have a question. I have a question. Sure. If you can go back to that previous slide, there's an item in the press recently, your nature-based solutions. There is something that's been approved for human body composting. Does that fit your nature-based solutions? The far right? The, no, there's nothing in the cap that falls under that category. There are there are actions related to composting under waste reduction and recycling, however, but not, not what you just referred to. Thank you. On uh, resilience and adaptation, this, the CAP assesses the city's vulnerability to climate change and provides resilience and adaptation strategies that address five major climate change hazards. Those include extreme heat, extreme drought, smoke and air pollution, sea level rise, and extreme storms and stormwater flooding. Uh, it, it's important to note that, that the, the CAP incorporates the city's sea level rise vulnerability assessment and ongoing uh, work related to the local coastal program. So there's no conflict between those two planning efforts. Uh, for other hazards, the CAP includes strategies to protect critical facilities and infrastructure. For example, there's a strategy to create a flood impacts monitoring program. It has strategies to protect public health. For example, there's a strategy to mitigate urban heat islands through green infrastructure. Uh, there's also, there are also strategies to increase, in general, to in increase community resilience to climate change. And for, for example, there's a strategy to establish early warning systems for extreme heat events. On the implementation and monitoring the draft, CAP provides an, a framework, an implementation framework that identifies the lead city department responsible for implementation. It, it identifies potential partners and known funding sources and provides a high level fiscal impact assessment. The time frame for the implementation of the greenhouse gas reduction strategies as laid out in the CAP was developed before the city's current CIP was adopted on, in May, 2022. So at that time we had a near-term, mid-term and long-term uh, separation of timeframes and with the near term being, for instance, 2022 to 2025. Well, the city's already gone, done its funding approval for fiscal year 22 to 2024. 
And so seeing that there's this two year process now, we, we are recommending it, or the staff is recommending, the planning commission uh, is recommending that these timeframes be adjusted slightly to represent those numbers on the right. So the near term would be 2022 to 26, midterm 2026 to 2030, and then long-term implementation would be those actions implemented after 2030. Uh, this, me, the, I'd like to ask a question. So that anybody that's watching this now or later they may not have watched the planning commission meeting where those discussed or right now. Can you please explain what you've just done in a little simpler language? Yes, this was driven by the, the, the recent CIP being adopted in 2022. It did not synchronize with the timeframes that we had in the draft cap, currently have in the draft cap. So we made this adjustment to reflect a, uh, a CIP that occurs every two years, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, this also reflects um, the fact that there were no long-term uh, actions identified in the cap. So what we've done with the term, with the long-term time frame, is we've pushed it out after 2030 because that's when uh, some of these strategies they don't need to be implemented until after 2030 in order to meet the the city's greenhouse gas reduction target. Do you find in your other working with other communities that there are other communities that have no long-term plan? Or was that an anomaly that you found here? Uh, no, this is, um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Chair, it, it, if, I, if I can jump in, um, the, the cap was released before the CIP and the timeframe. So we had to make sure that we aligned the our cap document with an action that happened um, after we released the cap. So that's the first answer. The second piece is the long-term um, uh, timeframes. I mean, the it is common to divide your cap into bite-sized pieces. So that's what this R cap does in terms of our GH, GHG reduction strategies. It it takes it in incremental fashions. And remember, the council's goal was forty percent below nineteen ninety levels by twenty thirty. So we, by design, identified the near term and then the midterm actions to get us to meeting that goal with the idea that there is long-term vision and that's what the, the extended timeframe for those long-term GHG actions do. It is common to do that in a CAP document. So it's not abnormal that there was no long-term plan. There is a long-term plan. But I mean, I identified specific long-term plan. There was no- There's, what it, we're doing is- a long-term plan simply to pick up what the short-term and the midterm plan no, don't get? No, we yeah. have long-term goals and the, and it is, it is in the industry standard to identify long-term goals to meet, to meet the GHG reduction. So it is normal to do it this way. And we do have long-term- uh, goals to, to get us beyond where the council's directive GHG goal is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Mallory, the, uh, the recommendation is that potentially we can amend the uh, CIP for the, for this budget that was just approved. The, our recommendation is we're just alerting you that we already have a slight change in the cap and that we're shifting the GHG if you want to go back to this, thank you, Jeff. Uh, that we that we're going to change the timeframes for near term actions to match what you already adopted. Okay, so then we would have to amend the CAP. No, this don't. this meets with this this aligns perfectly with the CAP. Uh, okay. Thanks to the Public Works collaboration. Okay, thank you. And I think what it also does, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Kathleen, is allow these near term actions to be considered in the next CIP because that would occur okay. within this near term time frame. All right, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, continue, thank you, Jeff. Okay, so the, the strategies and the actions in the, in the cap that are key to the city achieving its 2030 reduction target are highlighted in the staff report and and I will present them in, in, these, in the the next four or five slides. It's, and it's important to note that some of these strategies are already being implemented in compliance with state laws uh, or, or for other reasons. But for example, SB 1383 for recycling and waste diversion, the city is doing a lot to comply with that or uh, that regulation. And that's been incorporated into the cap. Uh, and it's really part of the overall plan to achieving the city's greenhouse gas reduction goals. 
And those with marked with an X are important in that they are providing the greenhouse gas reductions that are needed for the city to reach its, tar reach its target. So you see here under, um, let's see, under the category of clean energy, strategy E1, which is procure zero carbon electricity, and that's indicated by that X, E1, is one of the key strategies. And in fact, E1 contributes a very large greenhouse gas reduction in the cap. It's the largest uh, greenhouse gas reduction amongst the strategies. And the key implementing action is really to continue doing what the city is already doing, and that is to maintain uh, participation in the Clean Power Alliance's 100% green option. Currently, the city's at a 96% community participation rate. The cap is saying that a key action is to maintain a minimum 95% community participation rate. That'll be a key strategy to get you to your 2030 target. The other two strategies here do not have that uh, X mark next to them. Uh, they're important to the city's long-term goal, and then that's to achieve a carbon neutrality out to 2045, but they're not critical to reaching the, the 2030 target. Similarly, under the green buildings category, strategy B1 is important uh, in terms of greenhouse gas reduction. And the key implementing, implementing action there is to partner with existing energy uh, related agencies such as CPA or the Southern California uh, Regional Energy Network or VCREA. These are organizations that you already have uh, relationships with. And so continue to partner with them to, to promote and take advantage of local energy programs that improve efficiency of, of existing buildings and to identify uh, funding sources for grant, grant funding, for instance, that can uh, help uh, disadvantaged communities improve energy efficiency of older buildings. The other two strategies, likewise, from similar to that last category of uh, green electricity are important in the long run, but they're not quantified for the purpose of the 2030 target. Under transportation, we have five strategies. Here's, here are three of them, and they all are um, key to achieving the greenhouse gas reduction goal. And the most important of these is to expand zero emission vehicle charging and fueling infrastructure. That's becoming very important because uh, the state has a strategy to, to electrify transportation. And you saw in that previous graph how transportation is, is contributing a large portion of your overall emissions. And so this is something that's gonna to have to happen over years and decades. The city recognizes that it needs to develop a ZEV or zero emission vehicle master plan that looks at uh, uh, long-term and short-term needs for EV charging and as well as hydrogen fueling infrastructure and, and identifies optimal charging locations and identifies funding sources. And that's something that needs to be done for the community under T1 and for the, the, the municipal fleet under T2. There are other key actions that are, are more along the, the uh, partnership uh, track. So meet, meeting with utilities and state agencies to track and coordinate promotion of funding offerings, for instance. Uh, there is a, a key action to pass a resolution that supports city fleet vehicle purchases to be in alignment with CARB's proposed regulation that requires fleets to purchase 100% zero emission trucks by the year 2027. So these are this is an example of another thing that the city is already going to be doing, but it's incorporated into the cap. And then on expanding infrastructure for pedestrians, bikes, and micromobility solutions, the key implementing action there is to adopt the forthcoming sustainable transportation plan because that addresses expanding pedestrian and bicycle networks throughout the city. Another example of a thing already happening within the city. I'd like to ask a question of my staff on this one. Um, with respect to the um, charging stations throughout the city of Oxnard, at one time I had heard that they're highly vulnerable to vandalism. Has that been straightened out? What's the situation with respect to the charging stations? I had been hearing that the cords were being cut off. Is that still going on? Um, we have an, a, a current yeah, sure, status. Well, I'm not, I'm, I have not heard that, um, but I, that's not something that, okay, here you go. Good evening, Chair Committee members, Brian. Thank Yonis. you very much, Mr. Yannis. Thank you. So, oh, yes. Um, yes, we have two charging stations, one at OTC, which is Oxnard Transit Center and here at the parking structure. And yes, it does occur 
um, vandalism does occur, cords are cut, we replace them. Um, so, you know, uh, right now what we're dealing with is the transients go by and they think there's copper in there and there is a little bit, but uh, they continue to, to get vandalized. We haven't had anything recently, but they have, have been vandalized and we replace the the cords when uh, we can. And at one point we had a back order over eight months to get those replacement cords. So thank, thank you for sharing that information with our, the rest of our staff. Thank you very much, Mr. Yannis. But hopefully these new and uh, up and coming charging stations will be a little better with vandalism proof. So we knock on wood. Thank you. Please go ahead. Sure. There are two additional transportation strategies. The one that's quantified to reach the, and, and critical, to, or not critical, but important to reaching the 2030 target is expanding car and bike sharing. The city has, uh, it's, as again, again, has this uh, sustainable transportation plan that is looking at this. Uh, there's also uh, an action here to consider updates to the TDM ordinance to require TDM plans for all major developments or facility expansions. There are three other uh, categories of, of emission reduction in the cap that have reductions associated with them. One is waste reduction and recycling. I mentioned this one before. It turns out that waste is, a, uh, is, a, is an important one or, or diverting waste from landfills is important to keep uh, the, the organics out of the landfill in particular, which creates methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas. And so it has a, a good uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction um, impact or benefit in the cap. And so this one is really incorporating what the city is already doing. So you'll see that under strategies R1 and R2, or sorry, actions R1 and R2. Uh, in water conservation and reuse, the key implementing action is to maximize the use of recycled water or gray water for agricultural and for agricultural use and for irrigation at all large new developments. And uh, that hopefully that's taking advantage of the advanced water purification facility and finding uses for that recycled water. Then on land use, L11 act is a key implementing action. So it's really through the forthcoming general plan update, identify areas in the city where development should be focused to increase density and diversity of land use to achieve reductions in vehicle miles traveled. So city should be continuing to focus on reducing VMT through land use planning that creates less reliance on the automobile. Thank you, I have a question. If we yeah. go back to that slide, specifically with the gray water, there are a lot of residents because of the drought, they're concerned about possibly being able to use the gray water to water their plants. And from the long range uh, expectations on the weather, we could be in a drought possibly again next year. If we assist the residents, and I don't know that we are, and maybe we can have staff address that, how are assisting the residents by letting them use the gray water, how is that impacting our ability to do what you show on the chart, where we would only be using the gray water for large new developments to mitigation, mitigation and the agriculture? Do you have some feeling for what percentage of the population would use the gray water? I don't have any numbers for that. Um... I think, does, oops, sorry, sorry about that. Does your organization have any history of what other communities percentage use the gray water? Now, I don't know, Brian is on, Brian Schuster is, one, is my colleague who's on the phone. He might have some insights on that. He's been working on a couple of other, for a couple of other cities and counties uh, on, on on their climate action plans. And I don't know, Brian, if you- Jeff, why don't you hold one second? Let me, let me respond on one of the first part while we, while, while we prep um, Brian to, to think through if there's any numbers numerical numbers in other jurisdictions as, as using recycled water or gray water. Gray water specifically. So, so while you think about that, uh, Brian, one, th one item I want to make sure that I, that I addressed uh, in response to that question is that the Planning Commission actually also had this comment. So did the community. We had agreed with some revision language and, and one of the slides you'll see that I'm talking about the next steps that is to reflect uh, changes, minor changes, but and non-substantial, but language change 
Uh, and that's in a, an attachment in your packet. Uh, we have about 100 of these of these changes that will re be reflected in the final cap. Um, the first is the issue of considering allowing the use of gray water. And the California Plumbing Code allows the use of gray water in, cer in certain circumstances. Uh, we The draft cap before you has um, an extreme drought strategy, ED2, uh, to expand community and water recycling. And that's in four, page 419 of the document if, if the community wants to uh, read along. Uh, and that does encourage the use of gray water and rainwater catch systems. So the suggestion and in, in, in one of the takeaways in the revision table and to, for the cap is that we will expand water, con water conservation and reuse strategy uh, in the cap um, to encourage the installation of gray water reuse systems, specifically to respond to that question about the potential use and in promoting gray water. So we have one revision to make reference. We have gray water addressed in the cap, but we're speaking to encouraging the installation of gray water reuse systems. And we are actively encouraging it? I mean, do we have programs where residents can come in? The reason I'm asking this is um, the, the gentleman <clears throat> ended up buying the house from family members. And there's a particular tree that grandpa planted and it's there and they're cutting back on the water because there's more people living in the house and they're trying to cut back on the water. And the guy wants to know, you know, what are we going to do with the gray water? Is he going to be able to do this? Where do you get information at the, in the past, it's been send them to the county to get the information. Are we actively having providing information for residents that are interested in this? The, the public work structure is saying we're, at this point we don't have. Um, you would like? To, would you like to respond on this one? Great, thank you. And I and I do understand if we use the gray water, it's taking water away from our potential recycling where we can purify the water, but um, Mr. Chair, but the grandfather's tree. Can I make a quick recommendation? I know we're getting close to the 10 o'clock uh, time, sir, and, and we need to okay. vote to continue the since. Make, I'd, I'd second that. Oh. You made a motion to second? Okay. Can we take the roll call? Roll call to continue clerk? past 10 o'clock. Thank you for bringing that up, Mayor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Member Lopez. Yes. Chair Perello. Yes. Member Saragossa. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries three to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening again, Michael Wolf, Director of Public Works. So we do have quite a bit of water conservation information on our website. Uh, we do promote um, water conservation um, programs from MET uh, through bewaterwise.com. We don't have any active programs for gray water through that conservation process. Um, as Ms. Mallory mentioned, that is uh, through the building permit process in order to use the gray water uh, for irrigation purposes. Um, but to your point, Councilman Perella, there is for every one gallon that we don't take through the Oxnard wastewater treatment plant is one that we can't then put through the AWPF. Now there's quite a bit of time before we get to not having enough um, Sanitary, yeah, sanitary sewer, uh, not making it to the Oxford wastewater treatment plant. But, but to your point, there's a gallon for gallon loss. Um, but for me, that would be, you would need a, a, a very large amount of, of folks that do that before that becomes impactful from that process. Uh, but we don't actively right now promote any programs for this. We do have, or not us, but there are agencies out there, I think it's MET, uh, that promotes the rain barrel um, process. So there's some some conservation programs like that that are out there for funding. If the council, this goes forward to the council, if the council is interested in that, do they get uh, somebody such as Mr. Pengale to explain to us or the uh, city attorney to explain to us how do we get this so that we get it up in front mm -hmm. for the residents to find out? A good point. Because if, if the water gets scarcer and scarcer, it will most likely get a little bit more expensive too. And people are going to have to make a choice which plants do they keep alive, which ones they don't keep alive. And there will be some people that want to go, I don't want to flush it down the toilet, mm -hmm. which they can't use for gray water, but the laundry and uh, could be used for gray water. So what is the city manager may be able to help me out here. What's the process by 
we give direction if the council wants to go that way to inform the residents how to hook up a gray water system. You can make that recommendation as part of this and then we'll bring it back separately. Thank you very much. That answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Well, and Mr. Chair, I think one of the uh, comments from the planning commission was to add that portion, right, of what the community can do to help. Yeah. Uh, that's Chris, correct. Um, uh, council member, there's uh, augmenting the language to encourage the installation of gray water reuse systems. Will the will the planning commission be given equal weight as a council member's request? I hope the, it's a recommendation. The recommendation from the committee will and the planning commission will advance to council on October on October 18th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, staff. Please go ahead. So Kathleen mentioned that there were three items um, put in, uh, that were reviewed or put forth um, by the, the planning, planning commission for this meeting, but this started back in uh, with a study session in July where we went through the cap with the commission. We reviewed public, public input. There were seven areas that we discussed um, that we agreed to or that the commission agreed to. And then there were seven additional topic areas for further discussion. And those were meant or those were discussed in the, in the September 1st meeting. Uh, and they were paired back to three. There were four that were there was consensus on. Uh, and then three were were uh, that I'm going to go through in a moment here uh, ended up with suggested cap languages, additions or revisions. And the first of those uh, was related to the cap target. There were uh, a few comments by the public and, and some planning commission members that the cap should go further than that uh, council approved target of 40% below 1990 to be more aggressive and, and reduce emissions faster or go deeper uh, uh, in, in terms of, of reductions. And so the, the recommended revision to the cap is on page two to state that the city's climate action and action action and adaptation plan has an aspirational goal to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045 and to revisit the feasibility of that goal during the next cap update. And this will also acknowledge that updating the target may be necessary just due to the recent passage of assembly bill 1227 that occurred a couple of weeks ago that commits the state of California as a whole to achieving carbon neutrality by the year 2045. The second item that was uh, that had a recommendation was it, uh, re related to project labor agreements and um, but as a way to reduce vehicle miles traveled. It was acknowledged at the meeting that v v uh, VMT reduction is largely driven by land use policy and transit and bike and pedestrian opportunities and that re a reduction in commuter trips from PLAs would be relatively small and short lived. So the recommended uh, change in language was to uh, acknowledge in strategy L1 on page 330, acknowledge the relationship between VMT and land use and transportation policy and, uh, and transit and pedestrian opportunities as well. So to strengthen those connections in the discussion of that land use strategy. The third one was in relation to, there was a suggestion to allocate $1 million annually in the city's fiscal year budget to implement the CAPS and near-term actions. Uh, the, it was generally felt that including a specific dollar figure was not the way, right way to go since the, the costs are not known at this time. And, and Kathleen will say something more about that later. Uh, and that the state and, and state and federal funding is changing, it's increasing. And um, the, the recommended language is that the city will consider the cap and yearly de departmental bud budgeting and CIP activities and seek out federal and state funding opportunities where the funding aligns with council priorities and cap programs. I have a question on that slide, please. Yeah. Can you explain the rationale on the uh, project labor agreement slash vehicle miles traveled. I'm wondering, just in common sense, we're assuming that if we have a project labor agreement, everybody that would be working would be in a very close proximity to the job. And if we that don't have a project labor agreement, everybody that would be working would live outside of proximity of the job. So an assumption could be that everybody belongs to a organized union. 
Chair Perlow, that this was a comment uh, from from a law firm and a few uh, members of the community, and yes, that was the argument. And so from staff or the gentleman, the consultant. We provided this context to the planning commission and they were um, agreed with the suggested language is that VMT is driven by land use, by density. It's by, driven by a variety of, of factors, including transportation options, pedestrian uh, walkability. Uh, so this is a, the issue is, is not as simple as it was pared down to be. Uh, and with that in mind, we know that we're developing VMT thresholds. They're in progress now. We also know that with our general plan update, uh, which is going to be 2050 Oxnard, which will be kicking off next year, that's going to be a two to three year work effort. And that, that um, land use analysis is going to specifically look at all issues of transportation, land use, uh, pedestrian accessibility, walkability, sustainability, importantly, GHG. And so VMT is most appropriately addressed in our VMT thresholds as part of our environmental analysis that we're working on and the outcome of the 2050 general plan update. The reason I asked the question, uh, I'm a retired from a union. I believe in unions, strongly believe in unions. But I read that and I'm like project labor agreements usually involve unions. So I would think if we're going to limit our vehicle miles traveled, that means we're not going that far to the job. But if we have people that live near the job that are not members of unions, are we going to force people to join unions if they want to work? The, the comment didn't go that far. That's well, I, I think that's something that, uh, you know, when it gets to the council, I mean, I'm, I'm in support of unions, as I said, but I'm not in support of forcing everybody to do the same thing. Some guys like hot dogs, some guys like hamburgers, some guys like pizza. I'm not in favor of everybody having to do the same thing. That's my comment. But Mel, that's just a recommendation. Right? Uh, this recommendation from the Planning Commission is to strengthen that strategy L1 to not speak about PLAs, yeah. but instead discuss vehicle miles travel in the context that you affect VMT through your land use choices, through your transportation policies, and through transit and pedestrian opportunities. Mm -hmm. So no reference to PLAs. Yeah. Dumb question, then why is it up there? Because this is a recommendation from the Planning Commission for which it had more important, it had, we wanted to daylight it for the committee so that you're aware that this is a revision to address the VMT issue and this sensitive issue in our community. So if I get hit by a truck tonight and I'm not on the council when this comes to the council and no other council member watches this video and they see that, will there be somebody explaining what that means when it's on this chart? Yes, and there's also one of the recommendations action on that, yeah. Jeff, you can uh, proceed. Uh, are you completed? I think you're to the next slide. Yep. I don't, we're fine, Brian, thank you. So let me just uh, be quick, it's getting late. Um, so the next step on adoption of our, of our cap is that we'll be presenting uh, it to the city council on October 18th, complete with the committees, plural, their, their feedback and their vote. Uh, we also will be, as I mentioned, producing the final cap document to reflect the edits in a, a review matrix that you have uh, in your packet, uh, as well as uh, the input from the planning commission and uh, those three items and, and council's action on that. Um, we'll also be having a introductory letter from the mayor in the cap, which is ready to go. And we're gonna be able to put that in uh, as well as updates to some city photos that we believe are more reflective of our community. Um, and then also we'll continue to um, uh, post that on our, on our website and to promote the program um, wide and widely with our Clean Power Alliance partners. Um, ne thank you. Uh, in terms of this environmental analysis, the um, this document, the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, uh, required environmental analysis. It is a project, but it does, and it is an implementing element of our uh, 2030 general plan. 
There were two sustainable communities goals in our in our 2030 general plan. The CAP adopts, or, or pardon me, the CAP implements those those um, goals. And uh, as part of this action, we prepared an addendum to the environmental impact report, and that analysis determined that there are no environmental impacts associated with the adoption of the CAP. Next slide, please. In terms of financial uh, analysis and the fiscal impact of the CAP, um, the CAP strategies and actions will have a financial impact to the city. Funding sources will be needed and for the implementation. Those are typically implemented uh, in Chapter 5. You can see we identify funding sources as general fund, enterprise fund, or, or grants, um, which will be, all those will be identified through the budget process. Additionally, as we've talked about, the city's capital improvement plan is also a funding source for the, the cap impl implementation. And costs and details and the fiscal analysis for each strategy are not known at this time, and therefore we didn't cost out each of those items in the cap. One of the year one recommendations is to complete a fiscal cost analysis of near term cap actions so that we can prioritize and that would uh, once and, and we'll be seeking funding for that year one near term action uh, and then that will be brought forward to to Council. Uh, of course, we always seek to leverage partnerships with the CPA or Edison or so, uh, Southern California Gas or other uh, local and regionally uh, important climate collaboratives. Next slide. Staff's recommendation is to receive public comments on the draft, draft cap to provide recommendations on those three planning commission um, items that we, we covered, as well as staff's recommended edits to that language and to provide feedback on the cap document. Thank you. Let's take the public comment. Mr. Steve Nash, please press star six to unmute. Hello? Hi. Please go ahead, Mr. Nash. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, good evening, Chair Perello and council members. Uh, this is a good plan and I, I voted for it um, as a member of the Planning Commission. Uh, knowing that in five years, we can address some of the um, deficiencies and I think in five years time, we will be ready to implement a reach code. And I hope certainly before then, I, it was mentioned earlier about the, about the funding that we need to find a way to uh, fund and build um, the, uh, the planned uh, 1500 EV, EV chargers within the city. Um, we need to do that because transportation is certainly uh, uh, a huge driver of, uh, of greenhouse gas uh, emissions. Um, I think that also uh, I was I listened to the um, uh, I think it's the One Water Subcommittee of the Metropolitan Water District meeting today, and uh, they approved a um, an ordinance uh, banning the use of uh, potable water for the irrigation of non-functional turf. And it was agenda item 7-11 and in, a, in attachment to, they actually provide a model ordinance uh, language for that. So it's right there for the city to uh, plug and play, if you will, the, um, uh, the effect of, of climate change and, and, and the climate action plan and, and uh, certainly uh, water and uh, the amount of pre precipitation we get and the, and the kind of precipitation we get, you know, it's all connected. So uh, we need to recognize the fact that we live in a desert and we just cannot uh, use, um, you know, one of our valuable resources, water, to uh, to to uh, support um, non-functional turf. And the resolution deals with uh, commercial, industrial, and institutional 
uh, TURV. So uh, I think that would still provide uh, the ability for homeowners to have a, a patch of grass if they're willing to, to pay the price. So anyway, um, thank you for uh, your consideration. Uh, approve this plan and um, let's move on to the next iteration. Thank you. Good night. Comments, um, Madam Clerk? We do not have any additional speakers in person and we do not have additional speakers virtually. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, want to thank, you know, staff again, you know, heard a similar type presentation earlier today and, and the consultants for the excellent work and the planning commission. And the, I think the, um, I want to thank the planners and Mr. Nash and the other uh, commissioners, you know, for actually looking at this uh, item very, very closely. And I'll, again, you know, this is done in Spanish and English. And one of the things that I said earlier was that hopefully we, we want to thank them too for to convey the message of what we're doing and funding, I think is really important. And one of the things that, uh, that we need to look at is look for additional grants, you know, to fund, you know, the, the cap, you know, and also um, work with the earlier, I mentioned about working with APCD and Mallory, you can share a little bit more information on working with the APCD and the, and the AV stations, you know, and how they can help us, you know, do you want to share some more information on that, please? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Member. Uh, we have been working with uh, the, the County of Ventura VCREA as well as the Air Pollution Control District mm -hmm. to take advantage of uh, EV charging funds, uh, state and federal as well. There's been some targeted money to Ventura County. Uh, the issue is you have to have a v EV master plan. Some There's different levels of money. And if you don't have your plan with specific information on sizing and have it ready to go, when the funding window opens, the money is gone oftentimes with this specific type of money within like three or four minutes. So we have been anxious to uh, develop an EV master plan. And we, we believe there is a need for a targeted one for Oxnard. There's a number of EV master plans in Ventura County and within the Tri-Counties. Um, but that, that is something that is a near-term recommendation, and we are, are trying to take advantage of grants where we can. And also, additionally, we have to look at the CIP for the future, for funding in, in, in the near future. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Mallory, in terms of the, I mean, this is quite a document, and I know it was a, a very extensive process, and uh, I listened in on, on one of the community meetings um, with the outreach that you were all doing virtually um, at the time. And so given the extensive, I mean, process and the tasks ahead, are, is there an expectation of making any revisions in the future as, in, uh, the, as the, the plan is evaluated um, that we are you know, on track and, and meeting uh, the intended goals with the timeframes? Yes, that, the council member, that's a great question. I mentioned earlier that the cap should be updated uh, every five years. Mm -hmm. uh, the city does have an energy action plan and it has a metrics for uh, the metrics for energy use and consumption. Uh, I, I, made, I made an analogy to this point um, earlier today, which is it comes to, it's like a budget, right? You, there's no value in having a budget unless you check back if you're mm -hmm. We're operating within your budget. So uh, there is the recommendation for five years. And then through our recommendations for budget um, that we would be bringing forward, there would be the, the uh, funding request for looking at incrementally, how are we doing at adjust uh, at re reducing our energy usage and the corresponding GHG. Thank you. And uh, with that, there's uh, with some of the recommendations and the actions, the uh, the key implementing actions. Uh, I think at, at least one of them was a uh, passing a resolution uh, supporting the city fleet vehicle purchases. So, with some of these recommendations, are they coming as individual actions for the council to to take action on, or is it is it all encompassing with the plan being adopted that that these will move forward? 
Council Member, so the plan identifies the framework for getting there, and I'll add comments, and if Public Works want to add, wants to add anything, it, this would come as individual actions before you, with your budget, unless some of the items are as part of your CIP, and then it would be coming in that those two windows, in those two, in those two ways, and in that two-year CIP window. Thank you, and since this is a parallel to the CIP, uh, can we expect that when the CAP comes to the council, there will be a mention of the cap? Sure. Good evening again. Uh, the question I believe is sort of the implementation after a cap is approved. I, and I think it's very similar to like a general plan where you have a large overarching document and they have all these goals and objectives that come behind them. Um, and so part of that would be uh, setting priorities for council. Uh, there are certain things in our CIP project or CIP book. We have an unfunded EV um, charging station project. Uh, if this gets approved, that certainly would push that uh, up on the priority list and recommendations for the council to consider. Um, so those are the ways that we would be bringing forward projects and or programs or policies that would be up to the council to decide based on other resources and other uh, priorities. I hope that answers the question. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. I, I think it, I've, I personally was kind of taking it in a circle and you brought it back. Thank you. And and, and potentially you, can, you would have to look at a phase approach because of funding. Right, so this comes down to a conversation about priorities and, exactly. and resources. And so that really is the conversation we have all the time with council in terms of budgets that's right if if i can ask a question to mr pengelly and i know you haven't been presenting here but um one of the things that has come up in the past not specifically with you but there have been questions in the past when we have affordable housing projects come in and there are recommendations and i remember specifically ones that there were no washers and dryer uh, available except for a community thing there have been questions in the past, and I'm asking again tonight, any new project from a certain date going forward, can I feel comfortable as a council member that these will be hard projects with solar panels in them, all, you know, ready to go, not just wired, that if a project's going to come to the city of Oxnard, what do I need to do to feel comfortable if we're building a project for low income, middle income, market rate? that it's going to be set up for solar. We're, we're making a lot of things here. And um, this is kind of funny, but it's not. Mr. Funds and Mr. Grants are picking up a lot of the tab, Mr. Funds and Mr. Grants. And if we don't force ourselves, we're going to you know look for clean energy things, that's more expenses. But if we don't force ourselves to build facilities that are sort of self, you know, they, they help each other out by converting the sun to energy, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. Do you have anything you can shed on this? Or do I need to bring that up? And I apologize, do I need to bring that up and request it to the council to put it on the agenda? Because, and I spoke to Ms. Mallory before this meeting starts, it's not happening right here, but in areas of the country where people are dying in their homes because of the heat wave and the heat waves that are increasingly coming into this area, people that don't have the wherewithal to run the air conditioning for longer or do this or do that, they are suffering. But if we have something in place where they can sort of be helping themselves, even if it is forced by the city of Oxnard to be put in place, the challenge has always been people come up and for lack of a better word, they complain or cry. Well, you know, I can't make it and it won't fit in the affordable thing. So we're gonna have to give them a little bit less. This is one area of energy and power and clean power and, and carbon that, you know, it doesn't make a difference if you're where you come from in the city, whatever color skin you have or how much money you got in the bank, you are affected by this stuff. How do, can you address my concern? Or yes, Chair Perlo, uh, committee members, Jeff Pengele, Assistant Director with Community Development. Uh, I'll touch on some of those. I don't know if I can answer all of them, but I, I do want to reassure this committee that uh, any project, um, it meets all the requirements of the adopted codes. 
income, low income, uh, affordable, inclusionary, and none of that matters for the construction standards that they're required to follow. Um, currently, we're at the tail end of the three-year building code cycle. So all of the codes collectively called Title 24 uh, of the California Code of Regulations, that's the building code, energy code, electrical code, plumbing, everything is updated every three years. We're about to go through that update. So starting January 1st, we will have a new set of codes, including a new energy code. The new energy code uh, is what we follow for the PV, what used to be PV ready. Uh, last code cycle became PV installation for single family. This upcoming code cycle, that's going to move to PV being installed. In most cases, there's a few exceptions, but in most cases, PV will be required, PV, I'm sorry, photovoltaic solar will be required for multifamily, whereas it wasn't required before, and also for certain types of uh, commercial and industrial buildings. So the energy code, uh, the energy commission, I should say, does a tremendous amount of outreach for 30 or 40 different stakeholder groups through that three-year code adoption cycle, many public meetings, and they are incrementally walking us towards a, a more progressive solar approach, a more solar uh, aggressive solar posture with new construction. Um, there is nothing on the books for um, solar retrofits for existing homes or for room addition type of projects. This is for new construction of new units um, uh, for multifamily and single family. And it's also now for the first time next year going to be touching on commercial and industrial buildings. Um, you touched on resiliency uh, by means of solar, et cetera. Um, resiliency is a key component to the climate adaptation and action plan. Adaptation means there are certain things, um, as the term implies, you need to adapt to. Resiliency of the community is one of those things uh, that, it, that is a, a foundation of, of the, the climate adaptation and action plan. Um, so there's a bunch of different strategies that could be explored there. Solar, and as the energy code um, progresses, they're going to move into battery, um, uh, I'm sorry, energy backup system, energy storage systems is what they call them. Battery backups is what we know that, that as now. It could be a different technology moving forward. So we're moving towards more solar and a, a new concept of energy storage systems being required for new construction, which should help that resiliency. Um, so I, I, I don't think I answered everything, but let me know if I need to follow up. The, the, you mentioned that there's, you know, it's going to be coming in in a couple of years, a study in this and that. Are we looking at that they, they would be implemented by the end of the decade? Uh, let me clarify. So the, the new energy code that is requiring solar for the first time on multifamily and commercial industrial buildings, it's already required uh, for single family. That's taking effect January 1st of 2023. And we expect that as the progression has been for decades for the energy code and other codes, the energy code has been the most uh, uh, progressive code in terms of the most changes per three year cycle. Um, some other uh, energy, uh, electrical code, plumbing code, they don't really change a whole lot. The energy code changes a tremendous amount um, each code cycle. And so we can expect next year, like I said, the new PV and energy storage requirements amongst, any, uh, amongst many other changes. And we can expect three years from that, uh, uh, another big leap of energy efficiency and resiliency from the energy commission and the energy code. Thank you very much. Can I, it was, those are gonna be mandated items once they're updated, potentially. Um, Mayor, the, the energy code will be adopted as with all the other code updates in January. Now, within the body of the energy code, mm -hmm. um, it is a complex, it's a small and complex document. Uh, like a lot of codes, there's, there's exceptions and footnotes. In general, uh, the solar is going to be required uh, for single family, multifamily, commercial and industrial. Um, I can't say at this point if it's required for every single building or specific occupancies of commercial and industrial. Um, and there could be ways where you could do other, you could execute other additional building energy efficiencies far beyond what the base energy code requires in order to not install rooftop photovoltaic. So you would have to trade off. Um, that's those are some of the complexities within the energy code. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds. But on that. for the required, you're going to have to check off that they have to follow one, two, three, four, five as per the regs. Yeah, all all projects submitted 
uh, after January 1st, we'll have to follow the new updated energy code. Good so, point. Mr. Wingilly, can you clarify when you refer to these codes, the energy code and the building code, can you clarify where those come from? I don't want people to misunderstand that we those are, recreate those. those Thank you. Uh, yes, to clarify, these are their codes that are adopted by the state of California. We adopt them um, and have a, 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 an opportunity to make some small adjustments for local conditions. Um, so we adopt them. If we did not adopt those codes, they would become operation. They would become effective on us by operation of state law, anyways. So we and other all other local cities adopt the state of California codes, Title Twenty Four. So the mandate. Correct. We have very little latitude to change those right. codes. Thank you. Um, and I know that I complain sometimes when people look back. I look at the on Doris Avenue the um, new homes that have gone in and the landscaping in the front with the lawns and the sprinklers and stuff. I know that they were proved some time ago, but now with the current conditions, there wouldn't be, and we had a, I'm grateful that a member of the planning commission took the time to speak on this matter, that um, we things change, things look differently and you can't go back and fix, but going forward, I wanna know that we do the best we can. Thank you for getting up and answering the question. Thank you. You're welcome. Any we need a motion to thing. Any any questions? City manager like to say anything? I'd like to thank all the staff that presented and the consultants. Thank you very much. Make a motion to approve this item. One, two, one, two, three, and four. Second. Roll call, please, Madam Clerk. Member Lopez. Yes. Chair Perello. Yes. Member Saragosa. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries three to zero. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The next item, number five, Memorandum of Understanding and Caltrans Cooperative Agreement for the Village Specific Plan Wagon Wheel Berm slash Flood Protection and the US 101 Ventura Road off-ramp projects. The recommendation, it's a three-part recommendation, that the Public Works and Transportation Committee recommend that the City Council approve and authorize the following. Number one, the mayor to execute a memorandum of understanding with the Oxnard CRFL Partners Limited Liability Corporation for Caltrans right-of-way improvements agreement A-8497. Number two, the mayor to execute Caltrans cooperative agreement 07-5237 with Berm construction agreement number A-8348 and number three, adopt a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute forthcoming Caltrans Cooperative Agreement 07-5238 for US, for US 101 exit 63A off-ramp construction, agreement number A-8349. Again, with Measure M, there is no presentation, but there was a very excellent PowerPoint presentation. Um, I don't know if we have public comments on this, Madam Clerk, but- um, We do not have any public speakers in person and we do not have any public speakers virtually as of as of now. Thank you, Chair Perello. Thank you. Um, I did ask questions before this item came up and I will ask during this item, if someone can explain how the off-ramp coming to Ventura Road wagon wheel area will change, but I'll ask that during the conference. Do you have a question, Mayor? The, the, um, some... the, the question I have is that the developer is gonna pay for all this work, right? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Tatiana Arno, City Engineer. Yes, you are correct. Mm -hmm. The developer will be uh, paying for all of these improvements out of their pockets. And they're required by Caltrans and, and the city? And So yes, they are required to do this as a condition of approval. And uh, they, they have to work with Caltrans to get approvals for the final improvements, which I understand Mr. Perello will be asking about in detail. Um, but they they are basically responsible for doing these improvements. Now we have an agreement that we're going to be entering into with Caltrans because they do not enter into an agreements yes. with private entities. So we have to be essentially the middleman here. And that's why we are bringing forward to you an, a memorandum of understanding or an MOU to make sure that the developer does what they need to do in order to meet the requirements of Caltrans. And so also we can hold them responsible for these improvements. Yeah, and it and talks about funding the project and looking at the hazardous material sites and right-of-way engineering and 
giraffe encroachment permits and compliance with the environment and et cetera, et cetera, all the way through. Which is Correct. That is all the responsibility of the developer. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Ms. Aronot, the city engineer, Ms. Aronot. The um, comment that you made to hold, we would hold them develop, we'd hold them accountable. If down the road, there was a problem after this project sells out to the private parties that are buying it, who is left holding the bag if something goes wrong? That's a complicated question mm -hmm. that I might ask our city attorney to weigh in on. Maybe sure. Mr. Wolf. And, sure. and the reason is a backup as they're walking up here. Watershed protection is involved with some of the levy, but this because it's a private party and they're not tied in because of the intricacies of the river with the environmental concerns about the breeding period for a plant, an insect, and a mammal, there the work ability is very limited. So there are gates that have been put up and wagon wheel is going to develop and, and is already under construction. We're going to be having a hopefully a presentation in the future shortly with the watershed explaining what's going on. But the concern is um, damn it, what, Caltrans, sorry. Caltrans doesn't make a deal with a private entity because the private entity can go away. So they make a deal with the city of Oxnard. We are overseeing the work that's being done by the private entity. If the private entity's work turns out to be not what's expected, God forbid there's a hundred year flood and this is deemed to take care of a hundred year flood and it doesn't, who is going to be the responsible party? So let me piece this a, a little differently. So the conversation was about the off ramp. And so yes. it sounds like the question is more about flood protection, long-term flood protection and, and feasibility after maybe the LLC goes away. Is, that, is it more about that side of the house or about the the, the well, uh, offering since, since the subject matter is and I and I apologize for not talking to you before since the subject matter states memorandum of understanding with Caltrans cooperative agreement for the village specific plan wagon wheel berm slash flood protection and US 101 Ventura Road offering projects mm -hmm. so both flood protection and the off ramp the flood wall yeah so there's a lot that goes into sort of the what ifs and risk analysis and and is it a latent defect? Is it something that we missed? So there's, I'm not sure I can provide a very specific answer to the question okay. because it's, as Mr. Arno said, a very com complex question. Um, for construction purposes, we, also, we have bonds in place. We have those kinds of things in place. For maintenance purposes, we have CFDs in place. Um, so those, those are some of the belt and suspender approaches that we have for, for things that come up from routine, but you're talking more about maybe litigation issues. If, if something happens from a litigation standpoint, I think that's more commonly addressed through a, a risk management kind of conversation. Maybe uh, the city attorney's office can talk about that. And, and then Tatiana can talk a little bit about flood, flood management. Uh, maybe she can let, in, provide some detail in, on that. In full disclosure, I live in the South Bank neighborhood adjacent to this. And when I first got on the council, I was uh, admonished for asking questions and it went to the fair political practices. And a letter came back saying that being that I represented at the time 6,000 homes that were going into a flood zone, that I did have a right to speak. It wasn't simply a flood protection to protect Bert Perot and Susan Perot's house. So I, I can ask these questions. Um, with respect to the reason I'm asking it, you know, you're looking at a ding dong that bought a house with what appeared to be a levy, but it wasn't a levy, it was piled up dirt. Hmm. Since then, we've done a lot of work to protect Victoria Estates, and we're working our way towards the railroad bridge. And we still have a tremendous amount of work to do for SCR1, which is protecting River Park, which the maps that have been shown, River Park is going to have a large chunk, God forbid, if we don't get it straightened out, going into a flood zone. So the reason I asked, and I, and I understand, if you can't answer it, you can't answer it, but I cannot walk out of here without getting it on the record. If something goes wrong, the project is sold out, I don't want people that are living in the city of Oxnard at the furthest extreme from this area going, why am I having to figure up the issues with respect to this levy? 
just like people are asking questions, why am I having to get involved with the seawalls at the harbor? I don't live near the harbor. It's because at the time, there was an adequate thought process put into it when those things were done, or protection, or a, an amount of money put aside like to fix the seawalls, which is a different subject. But on this one here, um, I take it that it's a very complicated answer, and God forbid it doesn't happen, but I needed to ask the question. And if that's the best that we have, I can I can accept that. Chair Perello, I think I can give you an answer to that. So basically what's going to happen here is there's a set of three agreements. There's two Caltrans cooperative agreements, which technically would make the city liable for anything that might go wrong. But then we have the memorandum of understanding with the developer. And even if they're gone at some point after the LLC, what would happen would be a complex piece of litigation where we would be seeking some sort of reimbursement or damages against any private developer that touched the project that resulted in some sort of negligence or incompetence that caused some catastrophic failure. But there is a risk, always a risk, that the city would be liable for that at some point, just due to the fact that it would probably pose some sort of imminent um, health and safety hazard that would have to be remedied pretty quickly. And any monetary um, aspect that comes out of that would have to be remedied through a complicated litigation action. Thank you for that clarification, because I would like to ask this. There was an agreement, a memo of understanding with United Water Conservation District and the city of Oxnard about gravel pits. And they wanted the city of Oxnard, Shea Holmes wanted to walk away from their obligation so that United Water and the city of Oxnard would take the responsibility of this gravel pit. Um, there was a parting of the ways with United Water and the city of Oxnard, but Shea Holmes walked away. On this particular one, is there a bond that is put up for say 20 years or 30 years? Or is it simply as long as the developer is in place or the construction is done that the bond goes away? I know I'm asking a lot of questions here. Typically when the construction would be done, any bond that they would post would go away and it depends on the type of agreements that we enter into um, in terms of bonding that would stay in place. Um, I think that's kind of highly unlikely. Okay, thank you very much. I, I appreciate your, your answer. So the legal, is that uh, co-op agreement 075237 and on page uh, 301 of the presentation, A8348, uh, the Berman slash flood walls, is that? Uh, so that particular cooperative agreement is for the portion of the flood berm that is within the Caltrans right of way only. Only, okay. Correct. And so Chair Perello, if if this, I don't know that this will bring you peace of mind, but the developer is already actively working on the actual flood gate that they're required to build. And I do want to note that this went through uh, an extensive review process with FEMA and we actually have the county uh, at our side helping us through the reviews and they'll be helping us with the inspections of these and not to mention that they won't be able to continue development within that community without having this in place so they'll be limited to the number of units that they could construct before uh, or after this before this flood wall is uh, completed so they have an incentive to continue the work on this flood wall if they want to continue the development. Now, she already explained the, the legal issues should they sell off and they don't want to complete it, but uh, this is just another step that we're taking in, in, uh, in working with a developer to make sure that they get this flood wall in place. And this is one of the last missing pieces, which is getting this a co cooperative agreement with Caltrans so that they can complete that work. Thank you very much. This is a, it's a great looking development, a lot of good things there. Uh, you mentioned that watershed protection is helping review it. Is water protection, protection, Ventura County watershed protection signing off on it, or is it the city of Oxnard signing off on it? So actually, we both are signing off on it uh, through the FEMA process. Thank you very much. That's great to hear. Thank you very Mr. much. Chair, is that the floodgate on the west side of Ventura Road? That's the floodgate that's within the development itself. So, the floodgate on Ventura Road is a different project that's actually being led by the county themselves, okay. which is outside of this. Way. Okay, so that's it on the track, on the development, as opposed to the, uh, the west side of Ventura Road. Correct. Okay. For somebody who may be watching in because we can't, because of Measure M, mm, we right. can't show it. As you're on Ventura Road going north, yes. you go underneath the railroad tracks, but you don't go underneath the freeway yet. 
there is going to be a driveway going into the wagon wheel project before you get to wagon wheel road. Right. That driveway has the floodgate up at the top of the floodgate. I, I believe it's on wagon wheel road actually. So no, it's within the wagon wheel road it's, it's itself. Within, and is it going to be the new wagon wheel road or is it the, or the old one? It'll be the new wagon wheel the road. Wagon wheel road. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Well, that's a good picture to have a mental picture. Right. Chair, if and a follow up question because uh, the focus of, around your 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 questions that you raised was um, more long term flooding or potential flooding impacts. But what about uh, just regular ongoing maintenance? Who is responsible for that? There, the CFD will be covering the maintenance of both the the berm, any of the MSU walls that are going to be comprised, or this wall will be comprised of, and the flood wall itself, the one that's in the road. Great, thank you. And th you know, that's why the CFD is so important. Correct. <laughs> right. And then moving to the other one, can you explain how the off-ramp coming off the freeway will be changed? So at this time, the developer is still working out the actual design details with Caltrans, which is why you, you only have a draft of the cooperative agreement in front of you. Uh, as of right now, generally speaking, the geometry is similar to what you see there today. You get off of the freeway, you hit a stop sign, uh, and typically you'd be able to go either right or left. Now you'll only be able to go right in the new configuration. Uh, as of right now, that's where that's where Caltrans and the developer are, although we are uh, looking into maybe not having that stop sign there and going uh, uh, straight to a signalized intersection at Ventura Road. Can I one quick question? I hope I'm maybe legal can get me straight. On the CFD, when they purchase or probably purchase there, is there going to be a disclosure that they're going to have to pay into the CFDs? Because later on, uh, we don't want them to come back and say, I don't want to pay into the CFD and so forth. I think that's extremely important that maybe I'm out of line here. Yes. But yeah, I think you're, you're correct. the CFD, uh, the, there has to be disclosures when they sell those, those properties that they have to pay into the CFD. Correct. Because later on, you know, we've had problems in the past where they figure out, oh, I don't want to pay the CFD or I don't want to stop this. But anyway, I think that's extremely important that we, for that, for that reason. I'd, I'd like to carry that a little bit further and a lot deeper. Is there a possibility that they could vote themselves out of the that's, CAD and then leave the flood thing thank you. That's, that's uncovered? It, that's exactly what I was thinking about. It, it is a possibility, yes. But that's almost detrimental to the whole development. And so, and so in plain English, um, and no detriment speaking plain English, but in simple language, the people that are signing up that may already live there and the ones that would buy anything in the future, they understand they'll be paying a CFD, which does it state includes the protection? And they the sign a CFD. They should sign a CFD, a disclosure statement. And the reason, the reason for the new city clerk there's this has been an ongoing thing with River Park. They're going, you know, they have some people that they don't want to pay for nothing. Yeah. So the CFD has a rate and method of apportionment, like an engineer's report in there. It talks about all the things that are eligible to be paid for. Mm -hmm. um, River Park has a very similar one, but it's called a rate and method of apportionment. It talks about all the things that are eligible for paying to the CFD. So it'll say flood walls, it'll say gates, it'll say all those things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Do you need a motion for this item? Chair, I'll move a, a approval to recommend uh, this to the council. Second. Roll call. Please. There's no other comments from the public, Madam Clerk. Chair Corolla, we do not have any public speakers. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to confirm. Sorry, Chair. I'd like to confirm that we have a motion by Council Member Lopez and a second by Chair Perello. Zaragoza. Zaragoza. Zaragoza, thank you. Mm. Member Lopez? Yes. Chair Perello? Yes. Member Zaragoza? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries three to zero. The um, next item is measure is item E. Do we have any suggestions for? future agenda items. I don't know. And uh, I have none tonight. I want to thank the staff for everything they've done. Uh, it's been a longer than expected meeting, um, but thank you very much. And um, wish you good luck in the future with wherever you're going. Don't forget us. We're, we're going to work with you. Are you going to work with us? 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And this meeting's adjourned.